Hey, what's up? Welcome to another episode of What's Up Conversations, a podcast with great minds of pop culture. I'm your host, Hamid Rezo Nikufar, and today I have a BAFTA winner writer as my guest. He's the writer of The Summer Day, City of Wise, Trapped, and a new Netflix animation series, Castlevania Nocturne. My amazing guest is Clive Bradley. In this episode, Clive and I talk about Castlevania, Season 2 of Nocturne, History of Vampires, and the political aspect of the new animation. Before we begin, please make sure to subscribe to What's Up Conversations on YouTube or the podcast streaming app of your choice, if you are enjoying the show. Thank you very much, let's go! Hello and welcome to What's Up Conversations, Mr. Bradley. Can I call you Clive? Yes, of course. Wow, yeah. It's much easier. <laughs> so I'm so happy to have you on the podcast. So close to Halloween. So how's your relationship with <laughs> Halloween? Do you celebrate or wear costumes? Uh, well, to be honest with you, growing up in the UK, we didn't really, it's become a big thing now. Yeah. Um, you know, kids go knocking on doors and everything. So you have to be ready to give kids chocolate or whatever. But um, growing up, didn't really do it, so it's 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 uh, it's not really my background. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, congratulations on the uh, first season of Castlevania Nocturne. I finished it last Thank week, you. and it was amazing, with so many great ideas that we're going to discuss later on. But for now, I'm curious about the uh, conception of this spinoff. How did you? Uh, uh, how did uh, Nocturne uh, happen, and how did you get involved with this? So, as you know, obviously there was a, an original series of Castlevania, yeah. which ran to four seasons. And on the back of that, um, Kevin Colbert, who, who, who produced that, um, and Netflix came up with the idea of doing a kind of sequel spin-off show, um, which would be you know, very loosely, I guess, based on Rondo of Blood, maybe Symphony of the Night. Um, and so really there was a kind of... Um, call for the writers my my agent put me up for it um so you know, it, it was a, a gig i had to pitch for i had to have a meeting with with kevin um and you know make my suggestions for what i thought would be a way to do the the show um and so forth so that that's that's how i didn't i i had nothing to do with the old show at all so it was a kind of new new process that i was involved in in that way so did you know about uh, at that time about the games yeah, I mean, I'd heard of the games. I, 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 I knew that I knew the old show and loved it. I, oh, I was yeah. a big fan of the Castlevania show. Uh, so my my interest was more because of that, to be honest. Um, obviously, as I got involved, I researched the games, did it, found out everything I could about the games. Plus, involved in the process, there are a bunch of people who are very familiar with the games. Kevin, the Dietz brothers who direct it, um, Sam and Adam Dietz, and you know other people too who are involved in the in the show are very familiar with the game. So there's always that to, to, to rely on. Yeah. So the idea of telling a vampire story in the time of the French Revolution is such a great and compelling idea that the first time I heard about it was I was hooked, even if it wasn't Castlevania. The idea of powerful rich people preying on the blood of poor uh, is something very... Uh, it's a great allegory. <laughs> so, And it's so believable. Uh, given the fact that the revolution was uh, French Revolution was such an important incident in the history of mankind that changed everything about politics, modern democracy, uh, tell me about this uh, inspiration and why this time period was so important and attractive for a Castlevania animation. Well, I mean, to be honest, it was, when I when I when I first looked at Rondo of Blood, it says it's set in 1792. Um, and Symphony of the, of the Night a few years later. So when I first met Kevin, I mean, that was that was really my pitch. Look, 1792 is the middle of the French Revolution. Yeah. Um, let's take that seriously. Let's let's put it there. Let's let's dig into the the the, the, his, the history, the time and place in which in which this is happening. Um, so it was that. Obviously, I in any case was interested in in. I have a degree in history. I was I was interested in in that. Not I mean not French history, but you know that that is my 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 background. And so it it kind of evolved from that basic idea. It came, it came as inspiration from the game, and then it was all a question of how to make that 
um, you know, how to deepen that, how to find, how to, how to make that interesting, what 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 to use, what not to use, how to combine elements of history with you know the vampire <laughs> fantasy world that that we're in, which to me was just great. It was a great um, territory to explore, and absolutely, I agree with you. The kind of metaphor of the vampires feeding on the poor, although in actual fact, um, another inspiration. Um, I'm a big fan of um, Anne Rice and her vampire books. Um, and indeed, you know, the vampire of the stat, which is the second of the vampire books, which is about, well, the stat. Um, he 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 became a vampire in kind of roughly that period. And um, not a bit earlier, I suppose. But but so, so some of the early part of that is, is vampires in Paris, 18th century, I think, Paris. Um, and there the vampires are much more kind of outcasts were living in graveyards and kind of so and, and um so in fact the idea of making them part of the aristocracy um was really that was really kevin's uh kevin's idea because of the uh, the old show of what what the vampires were like in the original castlevania show so in fact from my original thought about it there was an evolution to that point that the vampires would be would be part of the aristocracy but then once you once you think that and yes absolutely it all makes sense Oh, this is brilliant. Yeah. Was any of the characters or villains based on uh, real uh, historic characters? Um, so um, the uh, the big bad, uh, Elizabeth Battery, is 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 a historical character. She's also in the games with a kind of anglicized name, not 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 in Rondo Bottle of Symphony of Night, but she's in the, one of the castles. Um, and she was a Hungarian countess who is sometimes called the worst female serial killer in history um and so when i found that she was in part of the law of the game she seemed the perfect uh, <laughs> perfect person to have as the as, as the villain of the piece and Gibraltar, uh I, I i believe is a historical character too who was her um son. Uh, so they're i mean they're, they're they're very far from the historical characters but they are very loosely inspired by historical characters i mean worst serial killer in history yes but she wasn't a vampire so yeah <laughs> she's so evil in this so uh this series has great uh villains both uh sorry, both. sorry I, I, should, yeah. I should mention one other historical character before i forget which is that when in when in uh episode three we go to saint Domingue, which is now haiti there is a character who is the kind of mentor of annette uh, Cecile Fatima. She is an actual character from the Haitian Revolution, wow. and that 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 event that you see in the woods, where she's, I, I think historically it's not her giving the speech, but but she is one of the one of the one of the leaders of that initial revolt in 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 Saint Domingue against the against slavery. So she G two is a is is based on a historical character. But without that episode was gr amazing. I love that. Maybe in compare with the last episode that's my favorite episode of the season yeah, cool. <laughs> yeah. so um I'll, 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 I'll wrote it. I'll, I'll yeah. Tell her. <laughs> so um great villains you have so many great villains and and also visually they are so striking and so uh recognizable and what makes a great villain and the other question maybe is that what makes a great villain and compare with the other villain in the same story I and mean, how do you kind of like leveling these characters like oh this is the big baddie this is the secondary mm -hmm. third one this is the great character here so how do you manage that and what makes it so evil yeah that's very yeah i mean villains are always fun i think you know a good villain is fun to watch and people people enjoy villains and they can be quite good fun to write too um, I guess in this story we've got kind of four villains really. Um, obviously, there's the big bad, which is Elizabeth. Uh, then there's Drolta, who is, um, I mean, on screen a lot more and is a much more, um, um, you know, a fun character, I suppose. Elizabeth's just kind of crazy, and yeah. they're, they're in the background for the first time. Uh, then there's the Abbot, and then there's Olrox. And I think Drolta, I think when 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 we get to season two there's 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 more you'll find out more about Trolter. i don't want to give anything away no spoilers obviously but um there's things you'll learn about her backstory um but um both the old rocks and the abbots to me are interesting because they're very conflicted characters yeah the abbot uh it's a thing you know 
some people have have felt that following the kind of tradition of the original show um that the church is portrayed in a very bad light now and partly in in this case it's because it's you know it is the history of the french revolution that the, yeah. the church was against a lot more the institution of the church was against the revolution uh, in the vendee in western france where this is set a lot of the the, the, the counter revolution was being led by the church so, so there's an element there which is just kind of to do with the history but the abbot is a character who who believes that his world and his faith is really under threat and he thinks that you know it, to, to defend it he's, he's prepared to go to well obviously too far but he's doing it because of what he he believes it's not it's not just evil he's not an evil man he's a man who is trying to do the right thing he believes and that to me is is interesting when, when does that when do you cross that you know that line doing good to and yet you end up doing evil Olrox, of course, is a vampire. Um, but in the first place, you know, he the, the first thing you see him do, kill Richter's mother, uh, is actually motivated by love. Um, he's taking revenge for someone he loved. Um, and so he too is is a an interesting character because he's very conflicted that he's not, he, you know, he's come to Europe because he's been asked to come because he wants to find out what's going on with this vampire messiah. But from the start, he's like, mm not sure about this um and that and of course then there's the extra dimension of his relationship with Mizrach and so forth so so that um so I, I, for me because you've got these quite complex I feel villains it means that the, the character of Elizabeth can be simpler um she she just needs to be evil and scary for the moment anyway um, she doesn't really come into it until quite late. Um, and so it, it, to, to me, that's the sort of map of it, is you, you've got the kind of crazy, she's kind of crazy chatting at the moon, um, uh, uh, talking about her father, the son and stuff. And so but, but underneath her are these more complex characters, which enable you to be a bit more straightforward about her. Exactly. It's, it's that answer your question? It, yes. It's kind of like um, she's the evil idea just just a single evil idea there and they're they just follow it and they just mangle with it it's kind of like uh lord of the rings i mean sauron is not that rich compared to like saruman oh, or other, uh, other villains yeah. but the notion of evil is that and the fact that we don't see her in in the show so much as the other villains kind of like gives her more uh uh mystery um power kind of in the back of our mind so yeah that that was great and it's it's working mm, so well, thank you i mean but sauron was actually you know was was a was a a reference yeah and obviously sauron you never you never see sauron at all exactly um so um decided not to do that but certainly that that absolutely that set in it for exactly that reason as you say that you have all these other characters like like saruman who are more complex saruman is you know he's interesting because he he was a good wizard who got corrupted um and that's much more interesting than just the evil but you need the evil there um to understand what's at stake yeah so uh i remember the first episode of castlevania uh when it came out people didn't have so much hope for it given the bad history of video game adaptations to movies and animations but the very first episode was so impactful that we were all shocked and then it took off and something that i believe is the best video game adaptation period so following the success of that show what do you think is the best formula to follow and consider when you're adapting a beloved rich world of a video game which is mm. not necessarily a word by word adaptation mm. i mean i think i think it it depends on the game um, obviously, with something like The Last of Us, you've got very, very complex story anyway in the game. So they were able to, obviously, with some shifts and stuff, but it, it, it's able to, to, to largely follow the, the, the story of the game. Um, with something like this, the game, the story in the game is very simple. And um, I think, to, I mean, you know, what some people wanted clearly was just for us to, to 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 stay close to that but i think that was never going to be possible because it's too simple to sustain a, a longer story we're looking at something that we knew was going to be one season possibly more you hope for more um so you know 
to begin with eight episodes and more but you can't you can't build a complex narrative around somebody basically basically running around the court castle rescuing people you you, you have to have something more complicated at, at, at stake and for me the way to proceed with that is you 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 develop the characters and kind of see where the characters take you and you have to have confidence and allow yourself to do that now again as i say that that the, the, there are there were people um involved in the process like like sam and adam deets who are much more invested in the game itself than, than than i was who were able to say no wait a minute wait a minute um but i think you have to kind of allow the logic of the story to unfold um if 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 if, if, if what you're adapting is something that's really quite simple if it's more complicated then it's a different story um but that that's that's my feeling certainly in this case yeah and what's interesting about castlevania i mean compared to as you've mentioned last of us is that uh those games last of us is for me is not working as much as castlevania is interesting because it's kind of like very very uh uh um word by word what we have seen in this uh, in the game so it's kind of like become uh, for me i love the last of us game so uh, therefore it was boring for me to watch watch it right. one more time and given the fact that i'm not playing it anyway not playing it i'm just watching it but castlevania what's great about it is that this uh, series is such a old series that kind of like not a modern ga game these days and but you can sense the feeling of those games here and what's here is the soul of those games and and that that's important i mean that's a new story but every element that makes the franchise great is in here so it's working great we have a first strong season for um castlevania nocturne what's the situation of the second season are you going to follow it up because with that amazing ending i can't wait to see what happens next um well obviously there, there are lots of loose ends to pick up yeah uh there's alucard's arrival wow um there's the fact that they've just been you know badly defeated by Elizabeth, and what are they going to do now um uh so i you know um what obviously what, we, what what we're doing is taking those threads and taking them forward towards you know a, 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 a big climax um so it's 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 carrying on the story this this this, 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 this we knew where we were going when we ended season one um so uh it's it was a deliberate cliffhanger <laughs> oh yeah i can see so i, I i'm not sure is it uh greenlit by uh netflix for se second season or oh yes yes yeah oh yeah that's great 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 yeah, do you know how many seasons are we gonna have for this i uh, don't know don't know yet we've got a great we've got we've got season two um so we're working on that uh, wow. but yeah no it's, it's all it's all greenlit and going ahead awesome so let's talk about vampires what is so interesting about these mythical creatures that we love so much that never get old and each year we have different takes on them and it works with many ideas i mean i, th I think there's obviously something just about the, the the thought of the of the undead which is quite kind of chilling but that there's something about vampires which enables all the, as you say all these different versions of what a vampire could be from the sort of you know the the the, the image in the in the in the Nosferatu movie, which is you know from the twenties, which is which yes. is just this kind of creepy, creepy, scary, horrible thing, through to um, the kind of Anne Rice or or the, a lot of the Buffy vampires too, who are you know very human and very uh, sexy and um, who are you know much more complex and conflicted and characters um and so uh and and for me for me that's where it lies it's 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 it's, it's and so old rocks is kind of typical of that the of character that you think is evil but maybe he isn't maybe there's something else going on here um which you get a lot in in the Anne rice books um and and in in buffy i'm a, I'm a huge fan of buffy I, I think I think if I had to say what is my favorite ever TV show, it would be Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which I've watched over and over again. I mean, I, I, I and there's there's so much there which is um, which is interesting. It could one of the, one of the things that there that the, that the vampires and other other demons represent is the kind of scary thing in the darkness that when you know it's there, 
you know you have a responsibility to fight it that there, it's a kind of almost a kind of allegory about um you know paying attention to the world and and, and wanting to make the world better and that that that, that there are these demons that you can't you can you can pretend aren't there but once you know they're there you have to fight them and i i think there's something in that too which is um which is kind of intriguing there's a there, there's a there are so many kind of metaphorical layers to to vampires that they they produce endless possibilities for storytelling yeah and it's uh and it speaks in different levels i mean these creatures are basically looking for eternal life by um feeding on people who are not like them and it's the idea is so evil that they can't stand the light so if you bring that light to this game you can you know defeat them or or uh, uh, the only way to d destroy them is to just like uh purging them at the heart so uh i mean and incorporating that with politics which you've done in this is so, so, such a smart thing that i want to see more i think this year um uh pablo lorraine had a, a movie about uh, uh benoche that was about a, a vampire i don't i don't remember the name el conte i don't remember and that's another political uh uh adaptation of this uh, these creatures so yeah um I have a question here now <laughs> that basically when we're talking about vampires, people ask, would you like to be a vampire if you had, <laughs> to, if you had the chance? <laughs> no, I definitely not. <laughs> um, firstly, I don't know who wants to live forever, but also, no, I, I mean, you know, the, 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 again, you know, the great interesting vampires like, like, I don't know if you've seen the adaptation of uh, Interview of the Vampire, which... Um, uh, I think AMC uh, made. Um, so Louis, that that central character, again, he's he's this fantastically conflicted character. As you say, he has to live by feeding off people's blood, but he doesn't want to do that. <laughs> so he tries to just eat rats and shit. Um, and uh, uh, that for me, I, I mean, that's very relatable. I think is that would you really want to? You know, I mean, the, the stat in in the Anne Rice books claims that he only kills evil people. And feeds off them but i mean how do you how do you make that judgment uh, so I, I i wouldn't want to be a vampire now. <laughs> yeah I, I that's understandable but I, I i always bring this uh uh idea that um okay whenever you want to die you just step outside in the sun and it's just that's over and, be, and uh, since we're living in modern days we can just <laughs> <laughs> get some bl blood without uh, uh killing people yeah, there, there, there's this uh, amazing movie by jim jarmusch uh, the only uh, uh, the only lovers left alive that that's my favorite vampire movie that's basically kind of like right. looking at it in a realistic way like if that was something right. real what would have what would happen if we were living uh, at 2023 for example that's a great movie. Yeah, and I mean, you know, and, and there've been a couple of things recent, recently which have done that thing of the vampire choosing to immolate themselves by walking into the light. One, one is Castlevania. Yeah, uh, Lenore. Did that. The other was uh, Midnight Mass. Yeah, I've um, seen that. One the, I, yeah, I, one I know the which, that boat scene that the was day amazing. After he turns. <laughs> yeah. Um, sorry if it's a spoiler. Um, <laughs> quite old show now, so I imagine people have seen. It. But. Um, uh, yes, which is which can be a very beautiful, powerful thing, and it's absolutely that that I don't want, I don't want to be this, um, uh, even if it means I live forever. So um, yeah, I mean, and there's something in that too—the kind of tragedy of a vampire. That, that a vampire can be a really tragic figure, exactly. as well as exciting and sexy and scary and all those things. There's all those all those different kind of perspectives and layers to to the vampire. I think that's clearly why it sustains as a as a figure yeah so what makes a great vampire story what do you think is the common thing that makes all the mo great movies and books uh relatable i think probably it's just it's just what makes a great story which is that um you feel an emo a, a, a kind of emotional connection connection to these characters I think also that you feel that it's got something to say, whatever that is. Um, for me, that's the that's the 
power of a good story is that it's saying something about the world, not necessarily something, you know, in big letters, just something that you, that, that talks about the experience of being a human being alive. But the, um, so I, I, I think probably that, you know, a good vampire story, it's the same as the answer to what's a good story, I think. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, let's talk about your favorites. What are some of your favorite films? Ooh. Um, well, I have um, I have a kind of pat answer to that question, so I, which I haven't revised for many years, so maybe it's not <laughs> true. But what I always say are my two favorite films are um, Spartacus, the 1960 Stanley Kubrick, yeah. uh, Kirk Douglas uh, Spartacus, that film, which I think is just marvellous from start to finish. Um, it has a climax where two main kind of heroes, Kirk Douglas and Tony Curtis, are trying to kill each other to save each other from something worse, yeah. which is, I think, and then at the end when Gene Simmons is, she's at the foot of her, of Spartacus saying, please die. And it, it's um, uh, it's so complex and interesting. And I, one of the things I love about it is that the, 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 the villains in Spartacus, so the Laurence Olivier character in Crassus, um, in a way, he's a bit like the Abbot. He, 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 in fact, probably at some level, he was in my mind thinking about the Abbot. He's, he believes he's doing the right thing. He believes in Rome. He's not just a horrible man. He thinks that Rome is something that needs to be protected and that these bloody slaves are endangering something which he thinks is, is, is perfect. And so he's motivated by what he thinks is th doing the right thing. And obviously, we don't think so because we're on Kirk Douglas' side, but he's not, he's not simply a a one-dimensional villain. And so for all those reasons, I love Spartacus. The, the other film that I always say is one of my favourite films is uh, The Bicycle Thieves, Thieves uh, 1948, yeah. um, Italian neorealist movie um, set in Rome about a man who needs a bike for work and his bike is stolen and he goes on a journey through Rome to try and get his bike back, um, which is a very simple story, really, about a man and his son. And it's just beautiful. Um I, you know, I, I have another film that, I, honestly, I would I would rate up there as one of my favourite films is uh, Adam's Family Values, right. which I've seen I don't know how many times. I think it's just brilliant, amazing, really funny, really clever. Um, just yeah, I could I could go and watch it again now if I was you know needed to make myself feel happy. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, uh, yeah, but obviously I love a lot of films. And, you know, um, we're in the what people are calling a golden age of television. And obviously there's a whole range of fantastic TV shows that, um, that I love. Yeah, those were great picks. So what was the last great film that you've watched and suggest? No uh, film. Last great film I saw. Um, ooh, I'm not sure I can answer that question. I blanked. Um, to be, I mean, to be honest with you, more, more recently, um, I guess partly because, I mean, partly because I, uh, maybe it's partly work, but I, I think it's also that because I, I do feel that there is so much fantastic television and, and I, by television, I'm including, you know, streaming services and all of that. Yeah. Um, that I, that, that my, I'm more engaged for the last few years with that than I am with a lot of films. Um, uh, I went to see a very good film actually um, two nights ago. Um, it was uh, the opening night for the Raindance Film Festival in London. It was a film called The Day of the Fight. Um, it's just a, a very simple film about a, um, a boxer in New York um, who's managed to get a fight at Madison Square Garden. And, it's, and the film is just following him for, for a day um, I mean, in a way, not not unlike bicycle thieves, I suppose. In a way, it's just following him for a day, doing putting his affairs in order before he has this fight in the evening, um, and that that was really powerful and moving. Um, uh, I don't know when it's on general release, um, but as I say, that the, the, there are so many, you know, small screen things to watch, and I'm behind with all of them. Yeah. Um that I, I think I tend to, you know, that's that's where a lot of my energy goes these days. Great. 
So, uh, yeah, this is it. Thank you so much, uh, Clive. Uh, your fusion of politics, history, and storytelling with deep characters is always a joy to experience. Castlevania Nocturne is a great piece of art that I can't wait to see more of. Thank you so much for your time, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. I enjoyed it.